a fitting time, I guess, to have a series called Christmas is Canceled because uh, that's what we're facing all around us. We live in what's called the cancel culture, right? Whenever there's a disagreement about something over a certain subject in life, then rather than agree to disagree, it seems like there's this push to create some sort of backlash against individuals, against corporations or businesses to try and hurt people, to try and hurt businesses, to try and and get things shut down or canceled. And it's not just now in individuals or businesses, but probably in one of the most challenging years that any of us have ever dealt with. We have a holiday that represents the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It also represents, though, the importance of family and togetherness, and it is on the verge of being canceled. I don't know how most of you feel, but had I said a year ago that we are all going to come to church one Sunday, hardly anybody will be here, people around us will be wearing masks, and governors will be announcing that Christmas should be canceled in our homes, we all would have probably thought, that is crazy, right? We couldn't have imagined, because canceling a holiday like Christmas would seem tragic. It'd be rare. It'd be unheard of, inexplicable. And as unheard of as we might think that it is, we have to understand that according to our Savior, this is just old hat for him, because the enemy has been doing his best to implement the cancel culture against God, against his people, and against God's ways since the very beginning. If we think about in the very beginning with the garden in Genesis, the enemy wanted God's ways to be stopped. He wanted them, his plans, his purpose that God had spoken to existence to be canceled. And so what does he do? He he stirs the pot. He twists God's word. He tempts man. He does his best to mess things up in hopes of a cancellation order. And guess what happened? Exactly that. There was a cancellation order that was put upon the Garden of Eden. Now, as we travel through our new Christmas series over the next three weeks, we will see this familiar battle continues to take place in the Christmas story and in our Christmas story today that God speaks forth his plan, that the enemy will twist it in order to see it canceled, that man will be tempted, but that God always fulfills his word. The goodness of our God is that he has always had a plan and a purpose. He not only spoke it into existence, but it has been written down for thousands of years for all to read, to know, to trust in, and to be encouraged by. However, the potential danger of God putting it all out there up front is that it could be used against him. I've always had some sort of admiration for people who have the boldness to put their plans out there up front for everyone to see to let people know what's going to happen, this is how it's going to happen, and this is when it's going to happen because it's got to come to pass if they're going to say it. Otherwise, they're going to look like a fool. When I was thinking about this, really what I was thinking of when it came to God, at first I was thinking of Babe Ruth and how, you know, I, I playing baseball growing up as a young boy, you know, Babe Ruth was a hero of all of ours and we would all get up and, you know, point towards center field because we had all been told the story about how in like the 1935 World Series against the Chicago Cubs, Babe Ruth was down two strikes and he points at center field and the next pitch, he hits a home run right over center field, 400 and like 40 feet, a monster crush. He called his shot from the very beginning. And then I, re, I, was, I was watching the video of it as I was writing my sermon, and I learned that none of that was true. He, he called his shot, but he didn't really point at center field and say, I'm hitting it over center field. He was arguing with the Chicago Cubs on the bench. But history told another story. So I was like, I can't use that. But I remember when I was young, 
I don't even know how I remember this, but there's this show, this movie called Billy Jack. And Billy Jack I, was put out in 1971. I wasn't born until 1972. So I'm not quite sure how this is such a prominent memory in my head, but it was something that I always looked up to. In that movie, Billy Jack, he's standing there barefooted, confronted by the police and they're all corrupt and the old guy walks up to him and, and he says, I guess your green beret moves aren't gonna do you any good now, are they? And he said, well, I don't know. I know this. I'm going to take this here right foot. I'm going to whop it upside this part of your head. And that guy said, really? And he says, really? And he went, <laughs> smack, knocked the cop down, right? Gets in this big thing. And I thought, wow. Like he told him exactly what he was going to do before he even did it. And that guy could not, the enemy could not stop it. And it happened exactly like he said. Like it just stuck in my head always. And it got me to thinking, that's exactly how God's word is. He tells us exactly how it's going to happen, and the enemy can try his best to stop it, to cancel it, but it is going to take place exactly as he spoke it. That is the amazing aspect of God giving us his word and, and telling us exactly what's going to take place. And the devil can try, and we see him try. You know, when it comes to the devil, we know that he knows God's word better than you and I probably know his word. That's the crazy thing. Because God's put it out there, he can try and use it against God. God the devil took God's word in the garden, and he knew it better than Eve. Because he twisted it, and he used it against her. We know that the devil was so bold in what he knew about God's word that he was willing to go toe to toe with the word made flesh in the desert and to try and do the same thing to the son of God himself. The devil knows God's word. He knows his plan, he knows his purpose, he knows his way, and he will do everything he can to try and cancel it from being fulfilled. And when it comes to the Christmas story in the Bible, it begins much earlier than we might expect. Most of us probably think of the nativity scene, but actually several hundred years earlier in the Old Testament, one Old Testament prophecy after another promises the coming Messiah, promises that there would be someone who would come to redeem God's people. And the prophet Isaiah writing nearly 600 years before the birth of Christ, was able to see across the centuries and gave us an amazingly accurate picture of the birth of the Savior, when in one of those prophecies, he would write in chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now there you have it. God spoke it through his prophet Isaiah. Isaiah wrote it down. And why did he write it down? For all of God's people to know. For us to be able to take encouragement in it. For us to be able to trust in it. But now that it would be written down, the devil would also know. Nobody knew the when, but here lies the constant challenge God's people learning to stay faithful and true to God's word in the unknown. God's people learning to stay faithful and true as it seems like his plans and purposes are taking a long time to come to pass. We don't know when, and yet we hold on, all the while knowing that the devil will attempt to cancel Christmas before it ever even really gets started. And we see him try to do this time and time again in a couple of different ways. Number one, if you go back to when Isaiah spoke this, the devil started from that very moment. I can imagine him thinking, oh, I see. 
there's going to be a sign to God's people. A woman's going to get pregnant. She'll be a virgin, and she'll bring forth this son. So what is he going to do? Number one, he's going to do his best to nullify God, to nullify God's word. He's going to try and tempt the Jews to turn away from the one true God. And he does that for the next several hundred years, just as he had always done. In Psalm 106, verse 13, it says, when it's concerning God's people, they soon, everyone say soon, they soon forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel. Like it didn't even take long for this to come to pass, that they would forget God's works. In verses 24 and 25 of that same psalm, it says, they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. They didn't even care to pay attention to what God had to say any longer. Now, I understand that Psalm 106 is referencing back to the Israelites in the desert, but isn't it crazy to think that they of all people would have seen God and his power, God fulfilling his word, God bringing his promise to pass, and yet it says, and soon that they would decide, oh, we're not going to wait for his counsel, that they would decide that they're not going to pay attention to the voice of the Lord. Now, you can look throughout all of the Old Testament, from Isaiah to Jeremiah to most of the prophets, including Hosea, and see that people were tempted by the ways of the world and by the enemy himself, and that every time they would fall into sin, that it would harden their heart against God and his word, that it would cause them, the scripture would say, to be blind, to be deaf, to be dumb. They're deceived in those ways, and it would nullify God and his word in their lives. Even if God has proven himself faithful in our lives, it is easy to be tempted to forget his works. I don't know how it is for some of you guys there this morning, but I know there have been plenty of times I could share testimonies with you guys of when God has pulled through for me when I desperately needed him, and I was praying and praying and praying, God, I need you to show up. God, I need you to show up. God, I need you to show up. And exactly when I need him is when he decides to show up and he answers prayer. That's happened in my wife and I's life many, many times. And those are amazing times. I've had times where I just sat at home and cried when something like that came to pass, like just amazed at the goodness of God. And yet, there have also been many a times where I didn't take the time to pray because I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to pray because I didn't want to get to that place where I would feel like I'm desperate for God to move on my behalf. I didn't didn't want to be Uh, put in the waiting zone. I didn't want it to be prolonged. I didn't want to have to wait and see, is God going to say yes? Is he going to say no? I didn't want to wait until things got desperate. And so I wouldn't wait for his counsel. I wouldn't wait for his his word to to come to pass. And so I would just make this decision. In my opinion, you know what? that looks like the right answer, that feels like the right answer. I'm just going to go with that for right now, and I would do it. And you know how many times I would make that decision, and most often it would lead to something worse taking place in my life. How quickly, how soon we forget his works. Whenever you choose to nullify the wisdom of God in your life, It's a recipe for disaster and destruction. And that's exactly what took place with the Jews. For all of those years, the enemy's goal was to wipe the Jews out. If not from within, then from without. And they were invaded by their enemies time after time. They were divided and scattered, persecuted and suppressed. For centuries, the Jews would seem fruitless in their efforts. A better word might be, might be impotent, which is exactly where the devil needed them to be, impotent in their ways. But that is also exactly where God would need them to be.
and a people who had been defeated, oppressed, and lost their way, we see the start of a new era in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, everyone say before, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. 600 years later, when most of God's people had forgotten or they didn't even care to pay attention, the enemy could not ignore that his efforts to nullify and cancel God's word did not work. And so he goes to the next best thing, which point number two, what's he going to do? If he can't nullify God's word, he is going to use God's word. He's going to use God's word. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Joseph, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. What's the writer describing? The writer is describing that when Joseph finds out that his fiance is pregnant, he has a choice to make. That according to God's word, which is God's law, according to the law, which is his word, Joseph has three options. Joseph can make her a public example, and he can have her put to death in front of everybody. Joseph can decide to put her away. And in putting her away, it would simply mean in those days, even though they hadn't been officially married yet, that they would still be able to get what is the idea of a divorce, a separation. And so he would be generous about it, not do it so it's publicly known, but he would quietly put her away. Or, according to the law, he could have followed through with his commitment to her. So listen, God's law, which is God's word, has the potential to be used against the plan and the purpose of God himself. Imagine for a moment using God's word for the potential of death, using God's word for the potential of shaming, using God's word for the potential of being judgmental, using God's word for the potential of canceling the birth of Jesus before it would ever even get started, attempting to cancel Christmas with God's word. It's hard to imagine, or we think it is, but the enemy tries to use God's word against you and I all the time. He uses God's word against us by reminding us of our sins. Do you not realize that you're a sinner? Do you not realize what you just did was a sin? Do you not realize how many times that you have committed that sin? Do you not realize that you are a repetitive sinner? He, he tries to remind us of our failures. He tries to get us to question God's word and to cancel God's plan for your life and for my life. However, the same word that brings death, which is meant to show us a need for our Savior, also has another side to it. And thankfully, Joseph was willing to look at all sides, and he didn't choose death for an impregnated Mary. But he also wasn't going to choose the most gracious option either, was he? I'll just decide to put her away quietly. Still, God's word was almost used against the purpose of God. That was until the Lord once again proved himself faithful to his word. Matthew continues in verses 20 and 23 when he writes in chapter 1, but while Joseph thought about these things, as he was thinking about them, he said, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, everyone say all, 
So all, everything that just happened, like everything that Joseph just went through, the debating in his head, what's he going to have to deal with if he were to keep her as his wife? What would it mean if he was to make a public spectacle of her and have her stoned to death in front of everybody? What if he just puts her away quietly? Like, I thought I was engaged to somebody who is faithful. Like, all of these things that, that he just went through. And then what Mary was going through herself not to dismiss the challenges that she had to think of, that, that she was facing in being pregnant and how society might view her, that all of this, every aspect of that was done that it might be fulfilled, that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. In other words, everything that they were going through in that moment in their lives, the trials, the questions, the challenges, they were going through that because it was going to be a fulfillment of the same scripture we had just read that took place 600 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. But what we will miss if we are not careful that Matthew does not quote is the first part of Isaiah's prophecy, which said the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, it should have been a sign that Mary was pregnant with child before she had come to know her future husband in an intimate way. It should have been a sign for all of God's people. It should have been something they had been watching for, that they should have been paying attention to, had they stayed faithful and true to God's word for all of those years. And we know that not all of God's people ignored God's voice, that they didn't take heed to what God might be saying or what God might be doing, because we know that there was Anna and Gideon, and there's people that are talked about that were faithful, and they were able to see the prophecy fulfilled that was spoken of, but the majority of God's followers were not paying attention. They were not looking for the sign. Had they been, they would have been encouraged by God's word. There's a reason why God said, this will be a sign to you. And there's two reasons why he would do that. Number one, because he wants his people to understand that his word is not nullable, that it can't be voided. Isaiah 55, 11, the same prophet would write these words that it is the same with my word. I send it out and it always, everyone say always, it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. The birth of of our Savior was spoken of by God hundreds of years before it happened. Now, if this was a sermon about the validity of the Bible, the evidence of Jesus Christ, that would be enough right there for anybody to know that there was a book that was written by a man named Isaiah that is not questioned and he wrote these words, and 600 years later, a man was born by those exact circumstances that would show the validity, the truth, the faithfulness of God's word in and of itself. But even more than that, we know that the devil would spend all of those years trying to nullify it, coming against it. I'm sure that he gave it everything he had to try and stop it from happening. And you could probably say that all of hell was against it. But God, but God took the impossible and the impotent. And through the power of his word, he brought his promise to pass because it always produces the birth of Jesus was miraculously fulfilled. The second part of why it would be a sign 
that we need to pay attention to is because God's word, he wants us to understand is a two-edged sword. Yes, it may point out death on one side to recognize the need, cause us to recognize the need for a savior. But the other side of God's word that he wants us to see is that it is meant for life. The same word that the enemy attempts to twist and use to bring death is the exact same word that is meant to give life. God's word not only always produces, but it always produces fruit, it produces life, and it produces life that is meant to prosper. Everybody say prosper. So not only would Joseph choose to keep Mary alive, but he would make the most prosperous choice. He would be obedient to God's word, and he would make her his wife, and he would be by her side as she would birth forth the Savior of the world. And this morning, I want us to see that even when it might seem like God's word has been stalled in our lives, doesn't seem like it's coming to pass. I don't see this fruitfulness. I don't, I don't see this sort of, of prosperity that, that's being talked about. Even when it looks like we're impotent in our circumstances and there's nothing that we can do to change those immediate circumstances. Even when it looks like cancellation may be inevitable, the Christmas story shows us that despite the enemy's best efforts, God's word is always faithful always fruitful, and it is always prosperous.